Hey everybody, so this is uh, live coding again with Jeff, and um, so we're going to be trying something a little bit different today. Um, so our last video was sort of covering over um, assignment one and um, sort of reviewing some common misconceptions and missteps that we could make and maybe sort of pointing everybody in the direction of a couple of positive things that we could do. Uh, and this week, uh, we are going to be uh, changing gears slightly. Um, as a result of uh, Umer and Scott and I getting together and talking a little bit about uh, how physics and C++ can get along, uh, we are going to be diving into using vectors and matrices to transform coordinates between um, physics positions and uh, render position. So I'm going to be talking a whole lot about um, using vectors and uh, I'm going to introduce you to a matrix class which I am just going to give you guys to build a vector around. Uh, more or less you'll be able to follow along in this tutorial how to construct that vector out and I'm going to show you one that has uh, a whole lot of nice features and hopefully show you a little bit about how to sort of incorporate those things. So really what we're doing here is we're going to be making a vector 3. Now we had made our GD vec 2 class and it was bare bones. It could do the minimum of what we needed it to but this time we're going to come at this um, with a little bit of C++ knowledge under our belts and I'm going to show you a little bit about how to engineer a vector class that looks good and behaves in ways that you will probably like. Um, so, um, just sort of to refresh our memory, so we had our GDVec2 class that we put together uh, previously in the demos here. Um, so it had a couple of constructors, um, so it had one where it would assume that it's zero and it had a second one where it would take in an x and a y value. Um, it could do dot product, check its length, normalize itself, and you could set it either to a couple of new values or to zero. Uh, there are a couple of operator overloads here for things like this, and this time we're going to talk about this just a little bit more. Um, but furthermore, we're going to do a little bit more interesting stuff with these. And why a vector 3, you might ask? Uh, we're only working in two dimensions. Um, truth be told, Scott made a really excellent argument to me that um, it's generally beneficial for people to start working with a vector 3 because it means that you can start learning about how to use transform matrices uh, in order to sort of deal with the graphical end of things, taking things from the physics world and transporting them into the render world. Um, basically being able to get things into the screen space or into the window space that you're trying to render them. You guys are uh, digging into SDL now, and of course that's going to mean that you are starting to talk about displaying images and like hopefully getting to the point where we can display an image that is connected to a physics body behind the scenes so that we've got some code that's responsible for dealing with the physical interactions of our object and then there's a there's a representation of that in the world somewhere um, that will show up as an image that we can draw on screen and so finally we'll be able to jump the gap from having physics displayed in Excel to being able to do something with graphics. So um, I'm going to jump over to a new project that I put together. So this is um, this is a, I just called it vector math. Um, it's not really any specific project. I'm just sort of using it for the sake of this demonstration. Um, you're probably looking at this class and going, wow, that's a lot of stuff. So okay, for one, don't freak out too much. This is the this is the matrix class that you are going to be getting from me. That you want to make a vector three uh, that is compatible with this. That's not especially hard to do. Um, we're going to start from the small stuff and we're going to sort of work our way up. We're going to talk a little bit about how to make a half decent little test for your vector so that you can make sure that you're not making any math mistakes because uh, there's really nothing worse 
than putting together a vector class and being so confident in your own code and finding out when you know your game starts to behave very very badly or weird that you just made a stupid math mistake in one of the vector operations and everything is going south because you didn't test it uh, so we're going to look at that a little bit um, but basically this this matrix is going to be uh, the thing that you are sort of building against. You can see in a couple places here, um, this include statement is broken because it can't find vector3.h because I have not included it in, that, in this project yet. So we'll be starting that up. And of course, any reference to vector3 in here is going to complain because it can't find any. Um, main in this project is currently empty, but we're gonna work toward um, how we can put together just like a really, really simple bare bones rough check that you can use to see that your your math is is working out the way that you kind of expect it to uh, there are much more sophisticated ways to test than what we're going to talk about today but uh this is this is good enough if you're just trying to sort of get something together and at least be able to um, look over how your equations are all working and see that that everything's working right um so I'm firstly going to add a vector3 class to this project. So um, add that. Um, I like vector3 a lot more than having this GD prefix on things, frankly. I, I like my name simple. So I'm going to add that in. Um, actually, now that I look over here, of course, so when we added this class, we got a vector3.h and a vector3.cpp. Um, someone may have noticed here that there is in fact a only matrix 4.h. There is no .cpp. Um, that is because I have actually written this class to um, be built only in this one file. And it has something to do with this really intense use of this inline keyword, um, which I'm not going to talk about in great detail, but it has some pretty excellent performance benefits. And a class like Matrix like this should really be um, thinking about um, performance in order to be able to, like, you know, do math quickly to sort of process through everything that your uh, your application is going to need. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find where this. Uh, I don't know, all the way over. Um, let me see, control MP. So, yeah, actually, so this is this is the thing fully expanded out. Ah, okay, I see. It doesn't have a constructor for that. That's all. Okay, so I'm using control MO uh, here. Oh, that should work. Control MO. Yeah, okay, so that collapses everything. Um, so as you can see, I have actually written out um, full declarations for everything in the .h file instead of just using it for definitions. Uh, that's necessary because the inline keyword demands it. Normally I would write these in a CPP file, but um, in this case I wanted to package this up as just one file so that when I give this file to you guys, you guys can throw it into your project, build your vector3 around it, and everything. Um, but if you want to see this thing like fully expanded out, there is some fairly intense math going on. Um, inverting a 4x4 four four matrix is a very dirty task, as I'm sure some of you have probably uh, thought about. Your math class, if you, inverting a 2x2 two two is no big deal. 3x3 three is three, starting to get a little bit tedious. 4x4 four four or any bigger than that, you're going to be sitting doing math for the better part of the afternoon. Um, so uh, yeah, there, there are some pretty gross looking operations in here. So I'm saving you the dirty work of having to piece all of these things together by, by giving you this. So I'm just gonna close this up because for, for uh, come on, collapse. There we go. I'm gonna collapse that up just so that uh, for now we can look over these, these uh, definitions if we need to at any point. Um, but our vector three, um, allow me to just copy over a small chunk of the stuff that I think that we're going to want. 
Um, I have a, of course, I have a completed version of this. Hang on. So I'm going to include a couple of things. I'm include string because I like string a lot. And I'm going to include string. Um, now you may wonder why I want these things. Um, so this is sort of the the minimal uh, expression of what I think a um, what I think a vector class like this should look like. Um, so this has most of the like basic mathematical features that I would sort of expect out of a vector. And um, Oh, surprised that in line. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah. So uh, it has most of the mathematical features that you would be interested in, and you will note that I am not shying away from using const in all the places that I think that you should use const here. Uh, because I'm sort of doing the walkthrough on this, I figured that it was bit best to do it in sort of what I consider to be the best practices way so that I can sort of lead you through that. If these consts give you trouble or if you're trying to piece this together yourself and they just keep giving you problems, by all means get rid of them. Uh, the code will work without them. It's just safer and easier to write after or like write applications with it if you are using those const statements everywhere that you can. Um, so uh, a lot about this ought to be pretty familiar. Um, of course, we've got our x, y, and z. So we didn't have z before, but not really a big difference. I have a constructor here. And you'll note that um, so this constructor is taking float x is equal to 0.0, .0 float y is equal to 0.0, .0 float z is equal to Point zero. Um, C++ allows us to specify default parameters, um, which means that if I only fill in x and y, um, so if I say x is 1 and y is 2, uh, the constructor doesn't require me to include z, and it will just go, okay, I know that x is y and 1 is, or it, x is 1 and y is 2 and z is 0. You mean to have a 2D vector, um, and you don't need Z for that, so no problem. Uh, and for that matter, if I didn't enter any of these things, it would just give me 0, 0, 0. Great. Um, so this, we've got a constructor that it will sort of automatically handle some of those things. Um, we have what generally I call properties. This is a habit of mine from um, C Sharp. Uh, you may have been introduced to the idea of properties there. So it's kind of like a, it's like a variable, but a little bit like a method. Um, it's a, it acts like a variable because it's sort of just giving you a value and it doesn't really, did, you know, like you don't really have to supply it any information to make that computation. So for example, like, so these are kind of the higher order properties, right? Right? Like, because a vector is made of an x, a y, and a z axis value. That's all it is. It is a position and nothing else. But you can think of a vector as having a length, and it's easily possible to compute that only knowing x, y, and z. So it's possible for us to do that. The length squared is sometimes uh, useful to us. You would think, well, why would I want that? I wouldn't, like, of course I want the length, and I'll just multiply two of them together. Yeah, except. The length squared saves you doing a square root and a division. It's good. It, it can save you a little bit of computation. So if you have access to this property, it can be nice to be able to use it because you'd be surprised how often length squared is actually useful um, despite that length is a little bit more um, uh, easier to relate to. Um, so I've got this thing to produce a normalized vector. I've got this which will negate this vector, which means to make it negative, reverse its direction. And of course, I have the ability to add, subtract, multiply, divide by, 
and the slightly more uh, beefy operations uh, for vectors of cross product and dot product. Um, and of course, sort of holding over from before, I've got my set. Um, so one set where I can set it from another vector, another set where I can give it an X, Y, Z, and set zero, which doesn't take anything because of course it just sets the vector to zero. Um, now the reason that I was interested in string and string stream uh, is this two string. So this is the oddball one, right? This is, all of these things are just definitions uh, and all of them are green squigglies right now because we haven't defined anything for them. But um, two string is not. It's using the inline keyword. Now inline, basically means that when this function is invoked, these, ex these instructions will be dropped into the source code exactly at that point. I don't want to go too deeply into what that means, but generally the important thing behind an inline, the use of inline, is that it can speed up your code by saving the computer looking up where that instruction is, where the function is in memory and running that, which can result in like the memory having to fetch the instructions and all that stuff. Now, there are downsides to overusing inline and inline can be a bad thing for um, big functions and generally its benefit falls away for, for functions that are longer. It's, it's most useful for functions that are short, just a couple lines. But um, I will let Scott dive into that if he's going to. Basically, uh, inside this, the string stream is just a more performant way of putting strings together than just sort of using regular string concatenation. And all I'm doing here is just making a nice printed form of the vector three so that whenever I want to, I can just say, you know, my vector dot to string and I can then use printf or cout or whatever I want to print that out to the console or if I need to write it to a file, whatever I want to do, I have it as a string, I can, I can do whatever I want with it. Um, so I'm just returning uh, the string that's built by the string stream here. If you don't feel like this syntax makes a ton of sense just yet, um, of course, you're totally welcome to just use like regular strings uh, to do any of this, or technically you don't really need this, but it is pretty helpful for some of the testing stuff that we're gonna talk about in just a moment. So uh, like most things, I'm going to copy this stuff over to my, my CPP file here and start giving definitions to some of these things. Um, so as usual, just Oops. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to sort of write each of these functions and we're going to delve into something that I mentioned a little bit before as well in the process of building this. Um, I talked previously about the idea of um, being able to sort of reuse your functions like a in our other vector that we put together, we reused set a, a fair amount uh, and we're able to sort of make a lot of the functionality inside that um, sort of come back to the same place. Um, and we're gonna do that again here. Um, sorry, let me, okay, so let's just get this vector as usual. We have to not forget that we need our um, scope resolution on here to make sure that these are connected to vector 3 and aren't just floating in the abyss. So I'm, uh, oh, and in your CPP, if you have default arguments like this, um, you should delete those out. The compiler will generally complain if you are redefining them. Um, so. Okay, so got all those things in, all our green squigglies are gone. Um, just as a quick review, 
this use of const at the end of a function definition, this means that this function will not change any of the members of this of this or this instance of this class. So if I have a vector three and I call length, there is a promise being made that inside length I will not do anything to change these values. Now I haven't really demonstrated this before, but since I have a definition for length right here, if I were to do this, the compiler actually tells me that I can't. Um, I'll admit that the error that it gives you is a little bit cryptic. Expression must be a modifiable L value. I'm sure Scott may, may get to talk about L and R values with you, but you probably won't see that until your second year. Um, ultimately, the reason for it is this const. If this weren't here, if I were to get rid of const, sure enough, it has no problem with this at all. But I'm using const here to state my intention about what length is supposed to do because there is no good reason that asking for the length of a vector should do anything to change the vector. That would be bizarre. So I am protecting myself and making it clear about how length should be used and what kinds of things that it should do to somebody who's reading my code. And that's a very important thing to learn is to sort of com find ways to communicate your intent about what it is that you are trying to write. And so that's going to be a thing that we talk about a little, a little bit more as we sort of go through this stuff. But before we get um, too far along with this, um, actually I just want to check on my vector for here. Still complaining. Complaining. Doesn't the exact had problems with this because to aha okay I understand um one more thing I'm actually not going to make this a class I'm going to make this a struct um so you see that this, this thing in, in Matrix 4 is still complaining here, and I was thinking to myself, well, why can it not find X or Y or Z? What's going on there? Why is this breaking down on me? Well, the reason has to do with access control. One thing I could do here, I could say that everything inside here is public. That's, um, that's a common thing that we can do. And as it stands, this is exactly equivalent to a struct. Um, for those of you with m like maybe more programming background and either some background in something like Java or, or C Sharp, uh, the idea of a struct and a class are pretty different. In C++, however, they're very, very similar. The only difference is that in C++, a class, by default, everything is private. But in a struct, by default, everything is public. Um, so really, it's more or less a decision about how much encapsulation you're interested in having for the objects in question. So having changed that, uh, yeah, good. That seems to be taken care of it. So just having this much, just having a constructor that does this and these XYZ members is technically enough for your Vector3 class to be compatible with this matrix 4, as long as you have it as Vector3.h and the class is called Vector3, struct is called Vector3. It has to have exactly that name and the file name has to be Vector3.h in order for this to work, but that's, uh, that's enough. This on its own is all Matrix needs to be able to do its work. The rest of this stuff is just added nice things that, that we can sort of build on to this. But so, okay, before I go any further, I kind of want to take a step back and think a little bit about what the, what the goal is with this. So in our third assignment, we're going to be dealing with a situation where you're going to have to have objects in the world rendering into an SDL scene. Um, which is going to mean that you need to work from a position in the physics world, um, apply some gravitational forces to 
to objects in that world and then figure out how they've moved. And of course, now that they've moved, they have to be rendered in a new location to the screen. Now, so that is a deeper question than many people sort of realize at first. Well, I have some object that's at like one meter X and two meters on the Y axis. How does that translate into it being rendered at, you know, 150 pixels from the left and, you know, 300 pixels from the bottom of the screen? Like, how do I get it to transform those things into one another? And so this is where this matrix comes in. So this is my, my wonderful rendition um, using paint and the wonders of mouse drawing uh, to try and sort of put together what this process kind of consists of. And I hope that I can make this somewhat understandable. So when we're working in a scene in a game, we generally are in what I like to think of as the physics world. So this is a space where we think about everything with SI units. Um, we're dealing with meters and kilograms and newtons and, you know, like all of the sort of like forces and lengths and weights, masses that we use to measure the real world because it is a model of the world. We're creating a mathematical model to be able to simulate real world things happening where we can use the equations that we're familiar with to do our dirty work and, you know, make cool things happen. But at some point, we have to take the information that we have in our mathematical model and we have to account for how is the camera set up? What does the window that we want to display look like? What are its dimensions? How many pixels across? How many pixels down? Um, and we have to find a way to transform these points into where they actually display on screen. And a common problem that you're going to run into is that in the render world very frequently, rather than having a coordinate system that starts from the bottom corner, uh, like the bottom left corner of the screen with Y going upward and X going across, now um, you are in a place where the top left corner is the origin and positive Y is going downward from the top, which may seem very weird to you and you may wonder why it is that that was the case. And surely there was a good reason for this once upon a time and it's sort of a weird standard for for our work but um that's really the long and short of it is that that's the way things are is that sometimes you're going to have to work in coordinate systems that are weird um and so sort of finding a good way to transform into that space uh is no less of a challenge but you you whatever it is you need to find a way to make it work so the question then is, is how do we take our physics object, which is at like, you know, two comma three, so it's at like two on the x-axis and three on the y-axis, and given some camera position and a, maybe a window size of 1920 by 1200, how do we get that this thing is positioned at 240 on the x-axis and 800 pixels down from the top? Um, we use what we call an MVP matrix. This is the model view projection matrix. You don't really need to be super familiar with that terminology just yet, but the idea behind this is one that you're going to see a lot in um, OpenGL. When you start talking about graphics, this comes out in a big way. And so um, we're starting you on this a little bit earlier than usual because SDL sort of gives us a good situation to be able to present this in sort of a, you know, like not too complicated of way is trying to get this to render here. So now I'm not going to delve into how you use the MVP matrix with this vector in this video, although I will definitely in the next one. Um, but the MVP matrix is what accounts for things like um, 
where is my camera positioned in the world, um, like what area is the camera looking into, and like how is it oriented, and um, ultimately accounting for how many, like, you know, what is the pixel size of the screen, like what is its resolution, what is its pixel width, what is its pixel height, like how do I sample um, images from this environment to place them correctly into the world. So this is, this is a fairly complicated subject, but it's one that you're going to see more and more of as time goes on. Um, for now, though, I'm just going to sort of quickly um, run through how you might expect some of these functions to work uh, in your Vector3 function, and then in the next video, we're going to launch off uh, into a little bit more detailed discussion of how we can set up MVP matrices to actually transform vectors and a little bit more of a discussion of uh, using operator overloading to make our lives easier and how that helps. So um, without uh, further ado, I might as well dive in and take a look at how some of these things work. But I remember how things went last time. We used set all over the place. And um, I want to uh, I want to jump in to this from set first and foremost, because it's kind of the central uh, function that gets used in kind of a ton of other places throughout here. So I'm going to start off by defining this. And in fact, um, it's a specific version of set that I'm interested in. This is probably what I consider to be the base version of set, the one that takes three floats, x, y, z. So this function shouldn't be, um, you know, a big surprise to anybody about how this thing works. We got new y, dead. So all this thing does is simply take the new x, new y, new z, and assign them to x, y, and respectively. Easy. Um, now, the other two versions of set that we have here really are just being able to use this set. So set 0, for example, we know that its intention is simply to set x, y, and z all to zero, and then that will call into here. And this is nice for a couple of reasons. Not only does it mean that if we change, if we change the way a function works that it will apply all over the place, as I was discussing last time we talked about this, it also has a benefit for testability. Um, so now that's something that I guess I'm going to have to hit. Um, well, maybe I'll stretch this video out a little bit so that we can look at that um, in a bit more detail in this video. But I want to show you how testability can be benefited a little bit by, by this sort of reuse that we're going to see here. Um, okay, so now that I have set in place, since it's kind of the, the base thing, um, the constructor is going to use it. Um, that's... That's uh, kind of a foregone conclusion that we're uh, we're taking in x, y, and z in the constructor, and, uh, setting our internal x, y, and z. Although um, to be safe, I'm gonna change these names to new x, new y, and new z just so that there's no clobbering of variable names going on, and yes, clobbering is the actual technical term. Um, so, just so you know, I mean, I'm occasionally sort of filling these things in manually, but you can highlight a variable here, um, just hit F2, and that will, or, or alternatively, I think you can do it with right-clicking. Um, and then just rename the variable and apply that. And that is a really good thing to do because it will prevent you from making a, making a mistake about forgetting something was named the same thing. Um, so you can see it's here. 
is f2. So that lets me go in here and sort of. So, okay. So let's look at um, some of the things that this this vector is going to be. Able to do. Look at the properties first, because um, there's some things in there that are useful. So length squared. Now um, you remember that if we're trying to get the length of a uh, if we're trying to get the length of a vector, we're basically doing Pythagorean theorem, right? We're looking at the one the square of the length of the x component and the square of the length of the y component. And for a vector 3, we also have the square of the length of the z component. And all those things um, give us the length of the hypotenuse squared. So that's, that's the length of the vector squared. Um, now, what this means is that the length, oh, pardon me, Square root requires that I bring in uh, math.h. So math.h includes the definition for the square root function. Um, so, or it should. There it goes. Yeah, so then even not knowing what length squared actually does here, obviously the length is the square root of the squared, so that's one thing we can say. But in order to do length squared, so if we have the x component squared, x times x plus the y component squared, y times y plus the z component squared. Boom. Um, and so any time that we want the length squared, we can get that out directly. But if we need the length, then this will handle doing the square root for us. Um, now, uh, an interesting situation where we might need the length is, of course, normalizing. Um, so normalizing, we have to divide our vector by its length. Um, and what this means is that it will end up being a vector with a length of 1 that it points in the same direction. But since we have this length function, well, guess what? We can reuse that. Um, now, I want to note here that I am designing this class to work in a very particular way. When we call any function like normalize or negate or add or cross or divide by any of these mathematical operations. I'm just going to go to the h file because I think this makes it more clear. So you can see that all of these things either have a float or a vector 3 return type. The reasoning behind this is that I am not using these functions to change this vector. You can use this vector in a mathematical operation and it will always return you a new one rather than polluting this one with changes because you might want to use this vector for some other thing as well. Um, this is helpful to sort of keep straight what variable names mean because when you name a variable something and then it changes in such a way that it doesn't really reflect its name anymore, uh, that can be a sort of mind-bending way to end up with some weird bugs. So I really prefer to have a class that will always return a new result rather than transforming itself. So what's going to happen with normalize here is that instead of changing its own x, y, and z, we are in fact going to... Um, actually, I know that we are going to use divide by, uh, and why don't we go and fill that in in a moment. So divide by, we can see down below here, is producing a vector 3 result, and it takes in the divisor, whatever is in the, uh, whatever's on the bottom of the equation, dividing by. So we're going to pass it a length, and it will divide this vector by the length and return the result. So what that looks like then, um, actually it could look like a couple of things. Um, yeah, so one way we can accomplish this 
is something that looks like turn. So we're going to make a new vector 3. And we could say x over, um, I guess I'm going to use other, y over other, z over other. And close that off. And so what that's going to mean is that when divide by gets called, a new vector gets created based on this one, but um, this one doesn't get changed because we have this const modifier at the end. We are promising that we will not change this one. And that should signal to people a little bit about how divide by should work. And we can go further with this, actually. Um, Divide and multiply are actually quite a lot alike. And you'll notice here that I am dividing three things. Division is not the fastest operation in the world, and we could do better. So what I'm going to do is, so I'm going to copy this into multiply. And of course, I'm just going to change those divide symbols into multiply symbols. And so we're now multiplying these things. Well, what I could do instead here is say, um, so I can get the inverse of the other, so I'm just dividing one by other to sort of put it on the bottom of the equa equation, so to speak. And then if we're multiplying something that has been inverted, we are just dividing. So I can pass that along here, and then I get two things at once. In one case, I'm saving us two divisions. This, this makes a little bit less math to do. And then this multiply function is able to get reused so that now everything comes back to here. My divide by flows through to multiply. And so that means that normalize uses divide by, which flows into here, which flows into here. And so there's only really this code that I would ever need to change to sort of update that whole process. And I use length here, which flows into length squared. And so that all kind of flows together. So really, this is the result of a whole bunch of function calls happening. And it really sort of like ties our code together so that if any modifications need to be made, they affect a whole lot of different places kind of all at the same time. And it saves us a lot of work. Um, now, negation is uh, really easy. All you're doing is making, uh, making this thing negative. Um, so, and the way that we do that is that we have we're returning a new vector, so we're not actually changing this one, but we're returning a new vector that is the opposite of this one. So all we have to do is return a vector 3 with negative x, negative y, negative z. And we'll just flip the signs on all of these things and uh, return, return a fresh vector that points in the opposite direction back to the caller. Um, and so... Um, Adding is a uh, simple one. And we could do the same thing basically with add and subtract that we, that we had done. Um, so this one is a little bit different than multiplication um, down there because, of course, multiplication is against a scalar, whereas adding is against another vector. So we need to say other.x, other.y, dot. That uh, again, we're returning a vector here. Um, and so here we could say oh, my mistake. That should be a vector three. And in this case, of course, then if we've negated it, we can pass that through to um, add because we're adding the opposite, so it's subtraction. And then that flows through to addition, so they are really the same thing. Um, and so we've got a couple of slightly more complicated ones over here. Um, 
I'm just going to sort of fill these ones in because they're kind of special cases. Um, cross product um, will lead you to sort of look at a diagram for how this goes if you uh, want to confirm the way that cross product works. Uh, I'm just going to sort of fill that in. Uh, feel free to use that in code. And dot product just consists of it returns a scalar value by multiplying the x's of the two vectors together, the y's of the two vectors together, the z's of the two vectors together, and then adding up all three of those results together. That's what the dot product is. So this gives us a pretty good base for this vector three class. Um, I'm just going to build this and see if it gives me any trouble. Um, none. Great. Uh, so now is the point where we probably want to take a look at how we might go about making some kind of test for our vector three because we've written a whole bunch of math in here, but I mean, as easy it is as it is maybe to look at some of these equations and go, that's definitely right. It is very easy in a situation where you're looking at these add or these cross product or these these functions where there's a lot of little characters floating around to just mistype one character and then it just does something weird um, a lot of the time. It's very easy to accidentally type a Y instead of an X somewhere or something like that. Um, there's all sorts of room for, for weird little mistakes that can happen. So I wanted to show you a thing or two about um, what you can do. It's not a very sophisticated way of coming about this, but you know, something that you can do to at least give you a handle on testing, testing some of the things that you want to confirm are definitely working before you go about using this in a bigger project where it might be a lot harder to spot that your vector class is behaving weird. Um, so I am going to include a couple things here. Uh, I'm going to include IO streams so that I can use uh, C out. Um, give myself a little bit of room. I'm going to throw a get car at the end here so that the program stops and lets me do what's going on. Um, and um, where's a good place to be? Well, why don't we try just declaring a couple of vectors? Um, so again, you can write this in a couple of different ways. Um, so let's say keep saying vector instead of three. Come on. So that's one way that you can write this, of course. Um, this syntax is also um, perfectly good. So, um, say 5.0, 3.0. Yeah, let's use the short syntax for this. So I have two vectors here, um, and um, I could simply try to add these together, right? I could uh, there we go. So I could have a third vector v3 is equal to v1 dot add v2. Now, of course, um, at this point, we don't have any operator overloads working yet, so we can't really do much in terms of fancy stuff to add these things together. But at least this flows a little bit more nicely than having to do you know, God forbid, something like this, which is really hard to read. Um, these two lines together don't make a whole lot of sense. And this is probably what we would have had to do with our GDVec2 um, that was, that had um, some functions that would change itself rather than returning a new result. So you had to use V1 add v2 to v1, but now v1 is really the result v3 that we wanted, so you end up, it, it's complicated, right? It's a little bit, it's a little bit challenging to figure out, just looking at these lines, um, like what exactly is going on here. 
So the way that I'm trying to approach this is that if we have a function that always returns a new result, then I can see on the very same line that v1.addv2 is returning a value that gets stored in v3, and it's very easy to read on that one line um, that that's what's happening. So that's that's sort of a, a big thing for me. I try to try to focus on that a lot. Um, now I'm just going to grab from my own code over here. Um, so let's. Uh, so I'm going to explain this in a moment. I'm just going to slap my line of code together here. So. All right, so what this line is saying here is I'm just going to print to the terminal. Um, so I'm just putting a little string here. Actually, you know what, let me run this once for you and then that, then we can talk about what it's doing. A lot easier for you to see it doing what it does. Um, so there you go. So I got a little statement here. So this v3 is equal to v1.add v2. So this is telling us what instruction is running and I'm, I'm intending for this to sort of match up so that when I look at my thing here I can see what instruction we're testing here and then I just print this on a new line uh, print v3 out so we had a vector 1 2 3 being added to a vector 5 3 1 so that should be 6 and y should be 5 and z should be 4 so 6 5 4 all right so now there are much more sophisticated tests that I mentioned that you could write, certainly, that make it so that the computer can check that the results are correct as well um, to prevent you from having to sort of like manually look things over. Automated testing is a very big thing and it can do you kind of wonders for, for these kind of situations. Um, but uh, for now, it's pretty good that we have the ability to at least sort of um, have a good way of dumping out the results here so that you can just sort of browse over what your program is doing and confirm for yourself that the math is checking out correctly just with some, you know, like some quick math on paper to prove that, you know, your vector additions are working and subtractions are working and dot product is working and sort of go through and do each and every one of these operations and kind of get them all, uh, get them all straightened out. Um, and then, of course, if you find any problems with anything, great. You have a great opportunity to go and fix them and make sure that everything's still all right. Um, so I think that's about as far as I'm going to go in this video. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, fancier operator overloads to, to get your vector class looking, working really nicely and easier to use. And I'm definitely going to expand on this whole testing angle that, uh, that we're interested in. Um, and then probably I'm going to end with a discussion about using matrices to multiply vectors to do um, transformations from physics to render space. That is, uh, that is going to be the, the sort of culminating aspect of this whole work on on talking about vectors here and uh, hopefully that will give you all the tools that you need to put together a cool assignment three all right I guess I'll talk to you next week bye everybody